I'm Michael Feinstein, and this is In the Archives uh, with Michael Feinstein, the Great American Songbook Foundation Archives, which is one of my favorite places to be because this is a collection of amazing materials that help preserve the story of the Great American Songbook, not only in history, but in artifacts that can be used, that can be brought to life and performed and shared once again. Archives are quite extraordinary places because they house so much of our history that can seem inconsequential at the time something is created and then in retrospect becomes very important in telling the story. Because often there are so many parts of history that are lost because people didn't think that it was important at the time or we were just simply going about our lives. And then as time progresses, people ask questions about this or that. And we don't always have all the answers because things that we took for granted have now been obscured by the mists of time. One of the things that has happened in the world of music is not only the way music is delivered has changed, but also the way music is copied and created and disseminated. Fundamentally different, as is everything in our world today. There was a period of time when an orchestration that was created for a person uh, was a group effort that took a lot of work on the part of a lot of people and was a very costly experience. These days, if a singer or a performer wants to do uh, a piece of music with an orchestra, an orchestrator will go to his computer and he will use one of his programs, if it's Sibelius or Finale, to create the music on a screen where he can very easily change uh, a note or a phrase. He can, he can delete it and put a new one if he wants to put the arrangement in another key. It's a click of a button, suddenly it's in another key. One has ultimate flexibility and then when it's done the parts can be formatted and you have a full score which shows the roadmap for every instrument of the orchestra that for which you're writing and then you have individual pieces of paper that are distributed to the orchestra to play and you can create it all on your computer or in some cases we have computer screens that sit at each music stand for each player and there is no physical paper at all. Everyone is reading from their screens. And so it has become uh, completely different on an economic level to create an arrangement these days because there is much less labor involved. However, when one goes back in history and looks at vintage arrangements, there are orchestrations that singers would pay tremendous money to, to have uh, in their library. And that's because every arrangement that you hear uh, on a Frank Sinatra record or a Dean Martin, Nat Cole, Rosemary Clooney, Natalie Cole, you name it, those are individual orchestrations that were laboriously written out by hand by an, or usually one arranger. And so there was a whole process that was involved with that. The first thing is that an arranger would meet with the singer and they'd figure out the song they're gonna do, they'd discuss what the key's gonna be, they'd figure out what the routine is, in other words, uh, should there be uh, a four-bar instrumental intro, an eight-bar intro before the singer comes in, then you do one chorus of the song, then will the orchestra do a little interlude, will you come back again at the end? You figure out the roadmap. Then the arranger takes the notes that they've made and they start to work on an orchestration and they write out a score. Now this is actually a, a photostat of a score by Nelson Riddle, but it is in his hand. And it shows how he has um, written in the names of the instruments that he is going to score. Uh, in some instances, there is a template that lists some instruments printed on the score paper. Uh, but he has to have an individual line for every single instrument in the orchestra that's going to play this arrangement. This is custom paper in that it has Nelson's name at the bottom. And then the uh, vocal line, in this case, is the top line. And so he has to write out this entire score and then he gives it to a music copyist. A music copyist is a person that normally works with the same arranger on an ongoing basis so they get to understand their handwriting, their shorthand, uh, because sometimes arrangers would write this stuff in a flurry of inspiration or in the flurry of meeting a deadline and it's sometimes a little hard to read these scores. So they would regularly work with a copyist who would understand their shorthand or simply can understand their handwriting. And so the copyist takes this and from this full score has would have to copy out individual parts for every instrument in the orchestra by hand. And there were standards and requirements 
for what that looked like. And so this is a score for the song Witchcraft, which was introduced by Frank Sinatra and arranged by Nelson Riddle. After the success of that record, Nelson did an instrumental version of this, which he recorded in 1962 and later played frequently in concert when Nelson Riddle and his orchestra appeared publicly. So these are the parts that were individually copied by a copyist by hand. And look at the beautiful, beautiful font or handwriting of this part. It's, it's really a work of art. And these copyists prided themselves on their work. And they all were part of the Musicians Union, the American Federation of Musicians, as was the arranger, where they would get paid on a per page basis, depending on how many lines were and bars were on the particular page. So there was a whole union rate for a copyist. And if there was a rush job where they had to get a, an arrangement out very quickly, then there was double scale, where they would get paid double the irregular amount of money if they had to get it done in a faster period of time. So all of these parts and this score, to have an arrangement uh, created, uh, would cost sometimes thousands of dollars. Uh, Nelson Riddle, back in the 1950s, charged, I think, $300 per arrangement to Frank Sinatra. And then the copying of these parts is something uh, that would cost a great deal of money. Uh, and in putting these parts together, because these uh, copyists were working so frequently uh, over and over again, copying for the same instruments, they got rubber stamps that they would use uh, for the scores. Uh, like on the piano part. Well, this says drums. So they had a rubber stamp that says drums. So they could just take the stamp and put drums. So they didn't have to write that out by hand. Or tuba, or flugelhorn, or you name it. These are the rubber stamps, the original rubber stamps that were used for Nelson Riddle's arrangements by his copyist, Vern Yoakum. And there are not only rubber stamps for the instruments of the orchestra, but there are also rubber stamps uh, with the names of the performers. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them here. Uh, for example, when Nelson Riddle did uh, his um, albums with Linda Ronstadt, the first album was What's New. This is Nelson Riddle's original score for What's New. And this is the, the rubber stamp that uh, the copyist Vern Yoakum used uh, for uh, Linda Ronstadt's uh, copying. This is El the rubber stamp for Ella Fitzgerald. This one is for Ray Charles. It's a very ornate one. Uh, Perry Como, Henry Mancini. Now, where did we get this music? This music was donated to the foundation by Terry Woodson. Terry Woodson is a currently operating arran arranger and copyist uh, and music preparation guy in Hollywood who uh, inherited his business from Vern Yoakum, who was Nelson Riddle's longtime copyist and librarian. And when Vern Yoakum retired, he handed the business over to Terry, who continued it. So Terry inherited such clients as Nelson Riddle, Rosemary Clooney, Frank Sinatra, and uh, Terry was the person, Henry Mancini, and Terry was responsible not only for copying any new music that was required, but also took care of all the scores and orchestrations and kept them in his library. Well, as happens with time, sometimes people pass away or retire or move away, and Terry, Terry found himself with an entire office filled with music. And as he's been downsizing, he returned a lot of the music to the performers or their heirs and families. And in some instances, some of this music became orphaned for one reason or another, or were duplicates or music that the artist didn't want and gave him permission to, to uh, uh, pass on. So we are the very lucky beneficiary of a tremendous amount of boxes of music from Terry Woodson, about 100 boxes, I'd estimate, that include uh, ar arrangements that Nelson Riddle created for Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra and Linda Ronstadt and many, many others, his instrumental arrangements, and then arrangements by many other giants of the Hollywood music industry. So we now have the ability to tell the story of what a music uh, arranger and what a music copyist did with score paper and with the artifacts, the rubber stamps, and the materials that now belong in an archive. And I'm glad that you visited ours. I'm Michael Feinstein.
Hi, I'm Sally Charles Helton. I am a professor in the library faculty at Butler University, where I'm also the head of special collections, rare books, and university archives. Um, my training is in library science and archives, and my subject masters and PhD are in ethnomusicology. I started my archival life as a sound archivist, which is not uncommon for ethnomusicologists, and I was at the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University and moved on from there. Um, I'm also a classically trained percussionist and also a drummer who over the years has played a fair amount of jazz and other styles and have worked as a semi-professional musician. So I have a lot of different kinds of relationships to this collection that I'd like to talk to you about a little bit today. So the addition of these stamps to a music manuscript collection really adds many layers of interest that speak to how music gets on the page, as well as adding an artifactual dimension. So in exhibits, either actual or digital, using a combination of paper materials and artifacts like these stamps gives a lot more context. It adds a lot of visual interest and will hopefully spark some questions about how they were used. The thing I find most interesting in how these stamps help to document the way that music gets on the paper is we're now living in a time when most people have only used printed music or now they're reading music digitally straight off of a computer screen. And it wasn't that long ago, like within many people's living lifetimes where music came in two formats. It was either written or copied by hand or it had been printed using a rather laborious and grade steel plate process. And examples of this are classical music and some of the early popular musics that got printed as sheet music. And it wasn't until photography and photocopying and computer technology that we've had a way to rapidly reproduce scores and parts mechanically and digitally. And a lot of us just have never thought about this. So music never went through the movable type stage the same way that the written word did. There were some attempts to create movable music type and even some music typewriters, but for a number of reasons, they just never worked very well. Music, written music is a much more complex form than, than written language. So for centuries, including most of the 20th century, um, when scores and parts were needed quickly, copyists have done this work. And at one point in time, there were major companies in, in the music capitals in the United States and around the world where this is the work that copyists did. And these handwritten parts represent much of the music used in the Great American Songbook. This is how this music was first recorded and first played, especially for live shows and for studio work. And so copyists, in many ways, really made um, Broadway and live shows and the club scene possible in that it became possible for them to do very fast turnarounds in getting scores and parts copied for pit orchestras or big bands or other music ensembles. And sometimes in a matter of hours, and I've heard stories told about copyists turning around score and parts inside of an hour. So as quickly as copyists had to turn around scores and parts, they would use these stamps to shorten the amount of time it took to make copies. And different stamps can help to easily differentiate different arrangements of the same tune. So at Butler, we have a four freshman collection of, um, of manuscript scores. And we can have, for one tune, we can have a number of different arrangements these can be arrangements for full orchestra, for big band, for a small combo arrangement. And these can all be 
by different arrangers, we can have you know, three full orchestra arrangements by different arrangers. So these stamps help you visually identify these materials to make sure that you've got the right set of parts and scores together. Even though these stamps can seem small and mundane, they give a wealth of knowledge and they really help to document how music commonly got on the printed pages of the Great American Songbook in much of the 20th century.